When astronauts Sunita Sunny Williams and Barry Butch Wilmore left Earth in June on an eight-day mission, they had to jettison their luggage to fit in some spare parts for the International Space Station. To fit that gear on their spaceship, they threw out their underwear before they left. That wouldn't have been too bad, but... Two astronauts from Boeing's Starliner are now awaiting a decision on when they can return home from space. After nine weeks on the International Space Station, NASA now says mechanical issues with the Starliner could turn their planned eight-day mission into eight months. Two astronauts, part of Boeing's Starliner, stuck in space for the past couple of months, are going to be stuck there until next year. Today, after a formal review, NASA determined that the Starliner is not safe enough to bring them back. NASA has decided that Butch and Sonny will return with Crew-9 next February, uh, and that Starliner uh, will return uncrewed. But rest assured, the pair are not still going commando. So they'll have most of their resources now. The, the resupply flight earlier in, earlier in the month would have taken their baggage up, so put it on a later flight, as it were, um, just as you would do with this late baggage like, on the plane. like going to Europe and losing your bags. Absolutely. Yeah, exactly like that. So we've got those, those things on board now. They'll probably have, have reassessed a little bit of the, the resourcing they're putting onto those resupply flights. Unfortunately, they, they had uh, an issue with the, um, the urine recycler on the space station. Uh, so they actually had to put a, a new pump on board for this flight that they went up on Starliner. Was he expected that they're only going to be up there for eight days, so maybe it's uh, not so critical. Eight months later, it's <laughs> looking like they might want their clothes. Kia ora, I'm Alexia Russell, and today on The Detail, what went wrong to leave two astronauts stuck in space? How they'll be getting back? And why NASA isn't willing to take Boeing's word for it that the Starliner they left in would return them safely? The decision to keep Butch and Sonny aboard the International Space Station and bring the Boeing Starliner home uncrewed is a result of a commitment to safety. Our core value is safety, and it is our North Star. That's Senator Bill Wilson, NASA's administrator, a former astronaut. He trained and flew with the crew of the space shuttle Columbia that broke apart on a 2003 mission. Seven astronauts have died, their families shattered. The space program has been dealt a terrible blow. The larger family of men and women in space exploration devastated. And the country has been reminded how dangerous it is and that for all of America's technological genius, it doesn't always work. Space flight is risky, even at its safest and even at its most routine. And a test flight by nature is neither safe nor routine. What a weird thing to go on an eight-day mission and it's like (laughs) Gilligan's Island's three-hour tour. You're still there months later. How would they have prepared for that? So the the astronauts on on this mission, uh, Sunita Williams and and Butch Wilmore, they're very... uh, very highly trained astronauts. They've flown many missions in the past, um, so they'll be very prepared for a variety of um, eventualities. I went to Auckland University's Space Institute to speak to Senior Research Fellow Dr Ben Taylor, who's their spacecraft engineering lead. He's also the head of a company that deploys technology in space to do things like clear up space debris, and he's been closely following the fate of the two astronauts. They basically train for, for as many eventualities as they've got time for on the ground. Um, and one of the things is you know, potential issues with return vehicles or, or other, other problems in, in launch that mean they're going to stay there a bit longer. Um, you know, the, the ISS itself, the space station, is, is very well equipped with resources. It's, it's been running now for, for decades. It's a very well oiled machine, <laughs> let's say. Okay, so they're not going to run out of food? No, plenty of resources on board. And in fact, there's, there's very regular resupply flights. There was one just at the beginning of August, uh, sent up some, some further supplies. They've got another one coming up in October, I believe, uh, as well as the, you know, the upcoming crew replacement mission as well. So it's, it's uh, quite a bustling station, really. Okay, so tell me what they will be doing now that their eight days is well and truly up. <laughs> so they're, they're, I'm sure there's a very long list of activities and tasks that need to be done on, on the station. There's uh, a lot of maintenance activities, you know, the replacement pumps for the toilets, for instance. <laughs> Great job. <laughs> they need to replace those. 
while Butch and Sunny are on board, they'll be doing science station maintenance. Um, they'll execute the SpaceX 31 research and cargo mission, and we may have a couple spacewalks for them towards the end of their expedition. Um, since they've been up there, they've been a welcome set of helping hands. They've already done about 100 hours of work on 42 different experiments, and they've helped us with some of the uh, critical station maintenance that we've had on board. Yeah, a lot, a lot of the day-to-day the -day sort of routine of actually operating a, a very large space station in Earth orbit. There's a lot of experiments happening on, on board the ISS, so there's a lot of you know, backlog of, of things that need to happen to do people's experiments that are, are waiting for results on the ground. So yeah, g general day-to-day -day activities. We'll get back to life on the ISS and why hair ties are vital equipment in space, but first, the arrangement with Boeing's competitor, SpaceX, to take the astronauts home on the Dragon X spaceship. And what happens now with the abandoned Starliner? Crew 9 mission will now configure Dragon for two crew members and will provide seats for Butch and Sonny to return. NASA doesn't send its own spaceships on low Earth orbit trips anymore, but it still needs to get its astronauts to the ISS. It's awarded contracts worth billions to both Boeing, the established and trusted legacy provider, and the new kid, Elon Musk's SpaceX. But in the past four years, SpaceX has launched 13 human spaceflight missions. The Starliner was Boeing's first manned flight to test the spaceship, which is designed to be reused. You know, it's disappointing that, uh, that they're not coming home on Starliner, but that's OK. It's a test flight. But it's more bad news for Boeing after what's been a horrible year for the company. Here's space commentator Leo Enright. There was a saying in the airline business, if it's not Boeing, I'm not going. That's the sort of reputation that Boeing had back in the day. They were the gold standard of safe uh, airplanes and safe spaceships. Now, as we know, very tragically, we've had a number of real disasters uh, with their aeroplanes, uh, the Boeing Max. The United Kingdom has joined the likes of Australia, Germany and China and banned Boeing 737 uh, MAX 8s uh, from the airspace. The move follows uh, the Ethiopian Airlines' fatal accident in which a Boeing 737 MAX 8 crashed shortly after takeoff. That is just a huge scandal of enormous proportions and it put into perspective, you know, how safe is the stuff that Boeing is building? Now, until today, this was all to do with their aeroplanes. Nobody thought that there might be a problem with their spaceships. Most of what they're worried about, I think, is OK, but it's a really really bad look. It's it's not a good look. I think Starliner is a very sophisticated spacecraft. It's uh, the majority of it is working uh, very well, um, and I'm sure there's you know fixes to these these problems. Um, I wouldn't anticipate that they're going to stop flying it. Um, I think actually NASA have reiterated that, that they, they're looking forward to the next next flight opportunity. NASA has expressed trust in Boeing. Senator Nelson, how certain are you that Boeing will ever launch Starliner with a crew on board again? 100%. Sort of. Boeing did a great job building a model. Now, we, the question is, is that model good enough to predict performance for a crew? Um, all the work we've done is really important also for bringing this vehicle back. We want the vehicle to come back uncrewed. It needs to land at the White Sands uh, Space Harbor, which is where the opportunities are setting up in September. And all the work that we've done, both on the NASA and Boeing side, give us confidence to bring the vehicle back. It has to execute a deorbit burn. It has to do all the things we need it to do, undocking from the space station safely. So I think together we have worked toward that, that part. There's just a little disagreement in terms of the level of risk. They'd had previous issues on their unmanned flight tests. Um, they'd obviously had satisfied themselves, NASA and Boeing, that those problems had been fixed. And now they're doing the, this first crewed flight. Um, in the process of doing this flight, they're looking to sort of stress test the vehicle a little bit, so put it through its paces before it then does its approach to the space station. Um, obviously, there's potential risk if something goes wrong that you're going to be you know, um, posing a risk to the space station. So they do some of these uh, early stage testing of the systems and checkouts. Um, that's where they started to see some issues where the propulsion system um, wasn't quite doing what it was meant to be doing. So the thrusters weren't firing quite efficiently, some of them were being shut down, 
Uh, they had some leaks in the pressurization system, so they're having helium leaks in the system there. So a variety of little problems they're having on, on the vehicle um, as they were coming to this approach to the space station. So yeah, valves and thrusters seem to have been um, kind of common theme, unfortunately, problems with those along, along this program. So the previous flights, they actually had similar kind of problems, maybe the same kind of issue, maybe a different issue, but again, with the thrust and, and, and valve issue, uh, systems. On a flight before that, actually, they had issues with their flight software as well. So unfortunately, that their program has been quite beset by issues. Well, it's not only Boeing's space program that's been beset by issues. They have had some problems with planes lately. Mm-hmm. You know, they've had fuselage problems and they've had a couple of bad crashes in the Air Alaska door. Does it generate a sort of a lack of trust from NASA and what Boeing's doing overall, or would it not be related? I think it would probably trigger a bit more scrutiny um, in, in terms of what their processes are in, in quality control. Uh, you know, there's obviously these repeated issues on, on the Starliner flights. As you say, there's been these issues on, on the, uh, the airframe from, from Boeing as well. So there's obviously some, some issue somewhere in the pipeline of their quality assurance um, on the company side. So I think there's, yeah could be more more interest in seeing where that is and, and uncovering where these good problems are going to come from. So is Boeing a little bit behind because uh, SpaceX has had quite a few people up there, hasn't it? Yeah, so the, the commercial crew program has, um, say, kicked off in, in 2010. So it's uh, a long way down, <laughs> down the track now. But actually, SpaceX were, were significantly delayed from when they were supposed to be launching as well. So I think the first one of those went up in 2020. And so they've been you know, firing on all cylinders, though, since then. They've been uh, you know, handling all the, all the launch for, for the U.S. side. But, yeah, they, they've, they actually had some early, early problems as well, though. So it's not just an exclusive <laughs> right. issue to Boeing. Okay. Um, whilst all the flight missions have been very successful for, for SpaceX, they actually had some initial problems on the ground. So one of their, their test um, items on the ground was lost, uh, an explosion actually with the thrust system. Um, so no, no crew on board, it was a test of systems on the ground, but actually they had a, a failure as well. And we've not lost any people yet. No. No. No, so, so no, no crew loss, and I think a very low risk really as well in this scenario. <laughs> oh, okay, but, um, but, but not no risk. Not no risk, and, and yeah, exactly. So... Uh, you know, after having lost two shuttles, you know, NASA is going to be incredibly risk averse to any problems that might arise on this one. Yeah. So getting back to the sort of timeline, the astronauts obviously got to the space station, mm-hmm. but when did they first start noticing there were thruster issues? So the thruster issues were actually encountered on the approach to the, uh, prior to docking with the space station. Um, there was some investigation. So the, 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 their stay was originally extended a little bit from eight days to, to a couple of weeks just to you know, investigate these problems a little bit more. There's a range of testing done both on board the spacecraft and on the ground to actually investigate and understand what the root cause of these problems might be. I want you to know that Boeing has worked very hard with NASA to get the necessary data to make this decision. We want to further understand the root causes and understand the design improvements so that the Boeing Starliner will serve as an important part of our assured crew access to the ISS. So they they were basically working on the space station, doing the various maintenance experiments tasks, um, and doing some of these investigations that they could do what they could access on on board the the vehicle. It's taken a long time, hasn't it, for NASA to finally come out with what their plan is. Mm -hmm. And so this last weekend we found out, what are they going to do? Yep, so the, they've decided that um, the crew will come down on the Crew 9, as it's called, the next uh, SpaceX launch. So now they're with... hitching lift for the opposition. Uh, absolutely. <laughs> well, I mean, bear in mind NASA are the customer of both Boeing and SpaceX. So yeah, they, they, that, that SpaceX launch will be going up with two astronauts. Um, it should be flying with four, be going up with two, and uh, the two that are already on the station will be coming down to fill out that four, basically, on, on its way back down. So that's launching uh, in September, um, and they'll be coming down then in February on its regular schedule. So they're not changing the schedule of any any other flights, basically. So it's it's all within their sort of standard program. And so they're, they're basically just chopping and changing who's on, who's on which seats. Why didn't they race up there to rescue these guys? Um, so there's not really any need to do so. Um, they've got the, the options to bring them down in the case of an emergency. So Starliner is still the, the, the emergency escape vehicle, as it were, for, for these two. There's enough vehicles, there's, there's a Starliner, there's a, a SpaceX Dragon capsule and a Soyuz all at the station at the moment. Um, so there's enough seats to bring everyone down if there's an emergency. There's never been a need to do that in the last you know, 20 years of operating the space station. So it's a very low risk of that, that happening. 
there will be a period after the Starliner departs and before the, the next SpaceX Dragon goes up that there is actually a shortage of seats to, to bring people down. Um, but their contingency for that is basically to strap them down in, in the, the, the cargo pallets <laughs> on, on the Dragon. Um, so that's getting closer and closer to science fiction at this well, stage. Well, yeah, it's uh, it, it's not an ideal scenario, but it's something that's uh, it's one of their sort of planned contingencies in the event that was a, an issue with one of the vehicles anyway. And NASA never looked at asking the Russians to give them a lift back down the Soyuz crew? Um, so they, they'd have to send another one up there because they, they've only got one at station at the moment. Right. So um, it wouldn't really be the best scenario anyway. No. <laughs> in any regard. Let's not bother them if we don't have <laughs> <Yeah>. to. <laughs> well, actually, the, um, the the next SpaceX Dragon launch will be uh, will have a cosmonaut on board from Russia uh, because they have this, this seat-sharing program. Oh, okay. And actually, the next Soyuz will have a, a, an American astronaut on there as well. So there is still this cooperation in space, but it's uh, probably a bit frosty than it used to be. Right. Now, they're going to bring the Starliner down, but without people on it. What will they do in that process? Try and fix it before it goes or take it down with, with its problems? Yeah. So so, so the Starliner is designed to be a reusable spacecraft. Um, so one part of it is, is uh, lost in space, so it burns up in the atmosphere. That's the, the service module. And then you have the command module and the, the capsule, basically, that comes down is reusable. Um, the issues they, they're having is actually on the service module. So that's something that will be lost on its way down. So we're not actually going to get that down to the ground to actually understand some of the problems, which is why they wanted to do these experiments on board the station and extend oh, that okay. period of time where they could actually investigate this problem. So try and find out as much as possible while they can yeah, what went wrong. Yeah, no, that's well, that's why they initially had this initial stay in, in orbit to investigate the problem um, and try and reproduce that on the ground. So have they come close to that? Have we had any um, updates about their progress in that? Yeah, so they've, they've done extensive testing. I think a joint NASA and Boeing team have done a lot of testing on the ground with a, another version of this system on, uh, in one of the test ranges. They've managed to reproduce the problem to an extent. They've actually found that when they're firing the thrusters in the kind of sequence that they would be in orbit, uh, they're actually generating more heat than they were expecting. And that's caused an expansion of uh, some of the, the parts of the sealing system. So some Teflon seals basically expanded, which constricts the flow of propellant, which chokes the engines, and then they don't get the, the propulsion out of them they're expecting. That propulsion system's critical to the return flight home, including undocking and the braking burn on the return to Earth. The small engines need to fire hundreds of times to keep the spacecraft in the precise orientation for safe re-entry and on-target touchdown. They've then tried to re reproduce that on the vehicle in space, um, and they've not quite been able to find exactly the same results. And so this is where there's probably been a bit of a disagreement between Boeing and NASA that because they're not being able to actually demonstrate that is definitely the root cause of the issue, they can't necessarily say that how it's going to operate uh, so, its way down. So NASA is not prepared to take that leap of faith? I think there's, there's certain margins involved as well. So there's a very uh, tight sequence of events that needs to happen when the vehicle comes down. So there's the... Um, separation from the space station, there's a deorbiting maneuver, and then actually orientation of the capsule on its way down. Um, so if they lose any of the thrusters in that process, um, by this, if this is a recurring problem, they won't necessarily have the time to, to work that problem and, and come up with workarounds on that very tight timeline before you come into re-entry. So there's, there's very tight margins on the timeframes, and so it's not something they necessarily want to risk a crew doing. The, the bottom line relative to bringing Starliner back is it was just, there was just too much uncertainty in the prediction of the thrusters. If we had a model, if we had a way to accurately predict uh, what the thrusters would do for the undock and all the way through the deorbit burn and through the separation sequence, I think we would have taken a different course of action. But when we looked at the data and looked at the potential for thruster failures with a crew on board uh, and then getting into this very tight sequence of finishing the deorbit burn, which puts the vehicle on an entry, and then immediately uh, maneuvering from that into a SEP sequence to separate the service module and crew module. It was just too much risk with the crew, and so we decided to pursue the uncrewed uh, technically. So they will, though, the likelihood of them getting that capsule back is quite high. It should, it should be quite high, yeah. I think, you know, I don't want to put a number on it, but it's, I think people are expecting really to come down without too many problems which will obviously be a big boost for, for Boeing if, that, mm. if that's successful. Really worth quite um, a bit of money, I imagine. Well, not, not just that, I think more reputationally than, right. <laughs> than the financial side okay. of things, absolutely. Well, speaking of that, at the press conference on the weekend, NASA was asked, do you trust Boeing? And mm. there was quite an interesting <laughs> answer to that. I wouldn't necessarily call it 
trust, I would call it a technical disagreement where we get uh, a group of engineers together and they disagree on the risk level of what could potentially happen to the thrusters. Which is you know, absolutely fair. Um, the, the Boeing team, I guess, will have, I think they've, they've got their, their problem solved. They know what the, what the issue is. Uh, but NASA will be taking a very different risk assessment of, of, of the mission. You know, the, this program has been running for a good few years now. The space station program has been running very well um, for decades. And anything that kind of risks a crew at this stage would be, you know, just unthinkable. <laughs> um, you know, the space station's due to retire in, in 2030 and actually be deorbited. So there's, you know, we're at the, the final years potentially of, of, the, of the station program. Um, so particularly at this stage, it would be, yeah, a very sad time to be losing a crew. As of yesterday, there were 12 humans in space, four SpaceX crew, three Soyuz astronauts and our two stranded visitors on the ISS, plus three people on the Chinese space station. Four more astronauts were due to have lifted off overnight on Polaris Dawn, another private SpaceX flight, ironically delayed because of a helium leak, the same issue that dogged the Starliner. So actually they'll be up to 16 in Gosh, space. it's going to be a pretty crowded house. Yeah. <laughs> How big is the space station? Uh, it's always sort of uh, reference to the size of the football field, basically. So it's about 400 tonnes, roughly speaking, that kind of scale. So do they each get their own room? <laughs> no, unfortunately, it's, it's shared spaces, I think. But uh, there's various modules on there. So there's, there's kind of the Russian segment, there's the, the American segment, there's European modules, there's Japanese modules. Um, so there's a lot of kind of shared space, but there's also more kind of national space as well. It's a long time to not be able to have a shower or eat <laughs> apples or vegetables. <laughs> what do they do for that kind of thing? How do they wash? Yeah, so I mean, there's there's uh, showering systems on the space station, so you essentially get in a bag and, uh, <laughs> and wash yourself down in that. It's, it's a bit awkward, I think. Um, obviously, water is at a premium. Um, there's a lot of recycling on board, uh, of course, of, of wastewater that can be recycled back into usable water again. Um, so yeah, shower systems are on there. I mean, people have been living in space now for, for many decades, uh, you know, from the shuttle program, Mir Space Station onwards really, uh, for long duration. So it's, uh, it's a lot of these systems that are actually getting in place and that's one of the ideas behind the, the space station is actually how do we live and work in space for a prolonged period of time. I'm a bit worried about Sunny because I saw it on the press conference. She had this amazing hair that's gone all over the place. <laughs> how is she going to get access to shampoo? Yes, it is a hazard. Absolutely, having long hair in space. So uh, yeah, hair ties are, are quite a critical piece of infrastructure, I think. <laughs> um, but yeah, in, in terms of toiletry, I think that's that's something that goes up on the resupplies as well, and uh, you know, various dry shampoos. And, and again, it is possible to wash hair, but a tricky process. And do they? Is there a language barrier between all the astronauts? Do they? Like, are they poked because they do speak Russian or the Russians speak English? Do they talk to each other? Yeah, I think that generally speaking, they'll, 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 I think they generally use English. Um, so the, the Russian side will, will be well trained in English. I think it's uh, pretty standard for the astronauts from you know, you know, uh, US and Europe to be trained in Russian as well. So it's kind of a, almost a bilingual station, really. Okay. Um, and if they do get a bit lonely, since they weren't expecting to uh, not be back <laughs> the week after, can they, like, can Sonny speak to a mum? Absolutely, yeah. So there, there's really good um, communication infrastructure in place now. So it's, uh, you know, they get high speed Wi Fi on the space station. She's doing fine. She's a professional astronaut, and this is her job. They know if they go up, something could go- happen that they might have to stay longer or come back. You know, they understand this. It's no big deal. This is what they do. She loves going to space. She said that's very, very rewarding when you're up there and you're looking down at the planet and see everything that goes down and what a wonderful place we live on. So she's not sad at all. She knows maybe this will be her last time up there. So, you know, she's happy to be up there. We are having a great time here on ISS. You know, Butch and I have been up here before and it feels uh, like coming back home. It feels good to float around. It feels good to be in space and work up here with the International Space Station team. So, yeah, it's great to be up here. So I'm not complaining. Butch isn't complaining. And if Sonny's mum isn't worried, I guess neither should we be. That's it for today. The detail is a newsroom production supported by RNZ and New Zealand On Air. This episode was engineered by Rangi Powick and produced by Gwen McClure. Thanks to Dr. Ben Taylor. I'm Alexia Russell. Matewa.